These letters and numerals are, I'd wager, pretty familiar to most typographers. Uh, I certainly find them very attractive, and, and maybe you do too. I know my colleague James Mosley does, uh, and I've often discussed them with him. James has written his own appreciation of them, which you can find on his uh, Type Foundry blog. Uh, and it's his appreciation and our conversations that were prompts for me to find out more about them. Uh, so about a year ago, I began trying to do just that. Uh, and in this talk, I'll report on, on what I've so far discovered. I'd like to start in Paris in the early 1920s, uh, and if we were to look around at that time, we'd have seen that Georges Braque was again using these stencil letters in his work, having introduced them into Cubist paintings some years earlier. If we were sports enthusiasts, we'd have found them on the bibs of athletes taking part in the 1924 Paris Olympic Games. And if we'd attended the 1925 uh, International Exposition of Modern Decorative and Industrial Arts, we'd have come across this painting by Charles-Edouard Jeanneré, also known as Le Corbusier. It would have been hanging in the Pavilion de l'Esprit Nouveau, which he designed. The painting is a late example of purism, a post-Cubist art movement that conceptualized and celebrated the objet deep objects whose geometries had, over time, achieved purified form through a kind of evolutionary process facilitated by mass production. Such objects were said to be the rightful constituents of modern machine age life. These objects were transferred from painting to the modern architectural spaces that Le Corbusier was then turning his attention to, as exemplified by the pavilion. With this in mind, it's surely not coincidental that stencil letters and numerals first appear in Le Corbusier's architectural drawings at around this time. They are indeed the typical French stencil letters and numerals. Unfortunately, it seems Le Corbusier said nothing about his use of stencils, so I will speculate on his behalf. I'd venture that apart from their simple usefulness for lettering drawings, these stencils appealed to him as objet deep. The mechanically stamped zinc plates and their geometrically informed and semi-modular letters and numerals do seem in a way purified and standardized in form and configuration. But we'll leave Le Corbusier there for now. Uh, I'd like instead to jump forward a few decades to the 1990s. Here's a letter from the director of the Le Corbusier Foundation in Paris responding to an inquiry about a typeface made by Lettreset, modeled on the stencil letters used by Le Corbusier. The correspondent asked if Lettreset had uh, an exclusive right to use them by agreement with the foundation, since Le Corbusier had apparently designed them. No, the director replied, the letters were not designed by Le Corbusier, but had instead be, been created by a Monsieur Thévenon in 1893. And here's a lead I'd like to follow. So there is a company by this name, Thévenon, still exists today, here's their website. They're industrial engravers, and they do indeed make the typical stencil letters and numerals which you find in France, and you can just see them uh, just at the back of the photograph on the, on the right. The company is located in Gergy, uh, which is a small town south of Dijon. But if you visit 39 Rue de Montmorency in Paris's third arrondissement, you will also find their name there, where it's been for many years. And if we were to look back through Paris trade directories, Tevenon is indeed listed year on year. But to find their listing, you'd need to go all the way back to, 19, uh, to 1884. Here it is. Still at 39 Rue de Montmorency. Prominently displayed are the alphabet and numeral stencils they made. And from other sources, we find that the company was founded the previous year in 1883. As you may have noticed, the name Tevenon is positioned rather inconspicuously beneath another name above it. That's because Tevenon had just succeeded an earlier company called Chevalier. Tracking back again through Paris trade directors, we eventually come to Chevalier's first listing in 1853, and here it is. 
The listing is plain, but it offers helpful information. We find that Chevalier launched itself as the only company making stencil alphabets and vignettes by mechanical means. We also read that the company was a partnership of four individuals, Monsieur Chevalier, Francioli, Michel, and Fouguer. Tracking back yet further, even as far as the 1830s, it's possible to build up a picture of the partners. Chevalier, Francioli, and Michel were stencil engravers who made sets of letters and numerals. Individually, they also brought specialisms to the partnership, such as in the production of vignette stencils for gilding, the design of decorated or foreign alphabets, the making of punches, or experience in export sales. Uh, Francioli, incidentally, also made stencils for marking posters onto walls, another subject I have some interest in. Fouguer, by contrast, was a specialist engraver, a worker in bronze, and a specialist in decorative objects of stamped brass for architectural applications. The company's focus on fabricating stencils by mechanical means is the first instance I'm aware of of a stencil maker in any country declaring this aim. It signals a transition from stencil making as a manual uh, activity to mass production, uh, and was probably informed by patents held by Chevalier in the production of stencils and by Fouguer's expertise in brass stamping. The work likely involved dyes, not quite like these, but I wanted to put some on the screen anyway, uh, but integrated into a dye stamping machine of some kind. Apart from classified listings, it's been difficult to find out much about Chevalier in its first uh, 20 years of operation. But then more uh, evidence emerges. Thus, in 1875, we find the so far earliest reproduction I've been able to come across of the typical French stencil, and here it is. Chevalier was also keen to mention the medals it had won in recent industrial expositions. Three years later, this half-page advertisement was published. For the first time, we can see the range of articles and devices the company made, in addition to stencils. More medals are displayed, and again, for the first time, a founding year, 1824, is given. Since the company was only established in 1852, the earlier date may be when one of the partners became professionally active, maybe Chevalier himself. And if you look at the present-day Tevanon website, which I showed earlier, you'll see that they still display this, this founding date of 1824. In 1882, a lengthy article was published about Chevalier on its 30th anniversary. From it, we learned, for example, uh, that they made a wide range of stencil sizes for which an equally impressive amount of tooling had been done. We also learned that by 1874, a Monsieur Tevenon had joined the company. He is described as Monsieur Chevalier's best pupil and most faithful collaborator, and by 1877, he had succeeded Chevalier as partner. There's some illustrations, too. In the center of the article, we uh, see this kind of trophy arrangement that presents a, the bounty of 30 years of business. In the foreground are the company's original product, letters, numerals, and vignette stencils. And beneath them, you can probably just see a metric ruler, uh, a, rem a reminder, no doubt, of the uh, measured precision of all Chevalier's work. So here, then, are the letter and numeral stencils probably made by Chevalier, but it's difficult to be certain uh, since neither they nor Tevenon, the company that followed, nor any other makers at the time marked their names onto their stencils. But both stencils have a set designation in the upper left corner, which I'll say more about in a moment, and another designation in the upper right, which referred to the quality and thickness of the metal. Their correlation with the illustration seems to confirm uh, Chevalier as the maker. So I'd like to go back in time a bit further uh, to discuss several issues these particular stencils raise in order to better place them historically. The first issue, well, maybe more a question, is where did these letters and numerals come from? One, can, uh, one answer can be generated by assembling a sequence of letter stencils in a, in a roughly or probable chronological order, say from about the 1780s until the later 19th century. Uh, I show those here, suggesting a, a sort of change over time. 
Because in France, stencil letters were understood to imitate printing types, one would expect this change to roughly follow changes in typographic form. And if one observes French uh, posters from the 1840s and 1850s, that is to say, around the time that the company Chevalier got started, one soon encounters candidate typefaces on which stencil letters and numerals could have been modeled. And if you uh, come across this poster by Jean-Alexis Rouchon uh, from uh, 1846, it confirms that stencil letters on roughly this model were already in use at that time. The upper detail shows this well, uh, but if you look closely at the letters in the lower detail from the base of the poster, you'll see ones that are really not very far off from what I've been describing as the typical French stencil letter. One could also make a sequence of numeral stencils from the 1780s to the later 19th century, showing change in variety. And although I don't have any confirmed examples of the typical stencil letter, stencil numerals in use in the 1840s and 1850s, it isn't hard to find similar forms elsewhere. As in this uh, 1850 publication just demonstrating their semi-modular construction on a grid. So not stencil letters, but clearly you can see uh, a resemblance uh, to, the, to the underlying form. So whether for stencil letters or numerals, the evidence is beginning to suggest the 1840s or 50s, but possibly earlier as the period when their now typical forms arose. So there are two other issues uh, I'd like to draw your attention to. Uh, the first is the range of sizes that stencils were made in, and the second is how these sizes were expressed. In respect to the first issue, I mentioned a moment ago that in the 1882 article about Chevalier, uh, it praised the company's many sizes of stencils. These, it said, ranged from 2 to 200 millimeters. I beg your pardon, from 3 to 200 millimeters. Now, the article, unfortunately, doesn't state the exact number of sizes they made between that, uh, that, within that range, uh, but if we consult a later catalog offering such stencils, we see the range is almost identical from 2 to 200 millimeters. And within this range, there are 37 sizes. Now, we may think of this as a sort of exemplary of French industrial fecundity at the end of the 19th century and the start of the, uh, of the 20th. But to offer you a comparison, have a look specifically at the number of sizes between 2 and 30 millimeters. There's 18 sizes that are on offer. And if I take you back 130 years to the specimen sheet of Jean-Gabriel Barry, which was acquired by Benjamin Franklin in Paris in 1781, when he purchased a lot of stencils from Barry, here we find an identical number of sizes, 18 in very nearly the same size range. So the fecundity can be found in the work of at least one French stencil maker at quite an early date. Apart from simply remarking on the number of sizes made, one might also ask why so many were made and why in such small increments, whether in 1781, 1882, or 1910. Uh, and I have to say, I don't have a good answer for this question yet. The other issue I wanted to discuss is how the size of the stencils was expressed. In 1781, we find that it wasn't. The handwritten numbering on Barry's specimen sheet, which you can see here, I hope, is simply a sequence to identify the sets of stencils that Franklin had purchased. Although the specimen sheet announces and illustrates the height of the letters, yeah, you can just see that right at the top, no measurements are given nor are any sizes marked on the stencils themselves. So how did one identify and specify the sizes one wanted, other than by pointing to them, uh, or possibly by making a mark on the specimen sheet? In fact, one wonders if Franklin, who was a printer, who was certainly a purchaser of printing type, and who definitely was someone who knew about type sizes, encouraged Barry to remedy this obvious problem with his marketing materials and with his, uh, his stencils. Well, whatever the case, five years later, we find that Barry had indeed begun designating sizes on his stencils. Here's the evidence, a set of numeral stencils with his address stamped on the three plate, 
boutique number 15 on the Pont Neuf. We can date the stencils to 1786 because we know that Barry occupied this address for six months that year. Looking closely at the one plate, we can just make out an eight scribed into the brass. The unit of measure at this time in France was the lean, which is about 2.256 millimeters. The height of these, letter, of these numerals is eight lean, thus about 18 millimeters. And as one looks at what appear to be later stencils, one finds set desi size designations marked onto the plates in various ways, either punched, inscribed, or handwritten. And here on the left is the same lean measure on what is probably a Chevalier stencil. It appears to have been used long after the imposition of metric measures in France in 1840. Eventually, it became a set number, probably at the time the metric measure was added underneath, which you can see in the middle image. And these set numbers, which were in fact obsolete lean measures, persisted on Tevenon stencils until at least the 1960s, uh, which you can see in the advertisement uh, on your right, when they finally disappeared. Okay, let's come back to Tevenon. As I mentioned, Chevalier became Tevenon in 1883, and slowly the Tevenon name took on greater prominence. But Tevenon retained the Chevalier name in its classified listings because this allowed it to remain at or near the top of the alphabetical listing of stencil-making companies. One company kept down or underneath in this way was Chevalier Fee, which you can see in the middle image. This company was started at exactly the time that Monsieur Tevenon succeeded Monsieur Chevalier, suggesting that the children of Chevalier did not benefit from his retirement and so set up a rival company with nearly the same name, making nearly the same products. In 1890, we find Tevenon advertising prominently in a publication showcasing the products of French manufacturing and industry. Making stencil posters was one thing you could do with such products using many of the stencil styles Tevenon offered, which you can see uh, on the desk or above it. Around the turn of the century, uh, the premises at 39 Rue de Montmorency was captured by the Paris photographer Eugène Atje. And if you look high on the facade of the building, just where I've highlighted, you can just make out this rather fantastic construction, complete with date stamper, A and two stencils, and the number 39 hanging below. Around 1910, this billhead came into use, overspilling with medals from industrial expositions, now 26 in total. And if we return to this catalog showing what I think are stencils by Tevenon, uh, we can take in their full extent here are 37 sizes, as I mentioned, available in uh, brass, zinc, tin plate, thick brass, and copper, and in metal qualities designated as ordinary, premier, and superior. Uh, in total, an astonishing 296 configurations were available. Needless to say, in the following decades, uh, there was an unsurprising, if gradual, reduction uh, in the options available. And today, it seems as though Tevenon stencils are mainly available uh, in high-quality zinc and in far fewer sizes. Uh, and to end my talk, I just uh, wanted to say a few words about typefaces modeled on the typical French stencil letters uh, and numerals. Now, James Mosley has written that the first of these was produced by a company called Rapatype, who made dry transfer lettering. Their version was laconically named French Stencil uh, and was released around 1970. Uh, and James recalls that he supplied his own stencils to help in the typeface's production. Uh, here are James's stencils, so presumably the Rapatype version is based on set number 36, whose letters are 80 millimeters high. Lettresette's charre, or charrette, uh, is very similar uh, and may have been derived from stencils of a similar size to the Rapatite model. However, many of the Lettresette characters have been made to a consistent width, which is wider than the corresponding characters in the original stencils. One also notices Lettresette's copyright attribution to Le Corbusier. 
Uh, and as the director of the Le Corbusier Foundation reported in her 1996 letter, which I showed right at the start of the talk, her conclusion was that the design was not registered or protected. Uh, and I would agree with this. Uh, while Tevenon did register and patent other of their products, I found no record of them having done so with these letters and numerals. Letraset letter deleted the copyright symbol from its catalogs, uh, though the Le Corbusier name was uh, retained and continued to appear there uh, as though it, uh, he should be credited with the design anyway. Among later typefaces, here are just a few. There's, there's quite a few out there. Um, here's a few that are modeled on or inspired by the typical French stencil letters and numerals, which in some instances also draw on a connection with Le Corbusier. They share a family resemblance, though each follows its own, its own taste. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to note a set of three typefaces made by Andreas Zeidel. Uh, you can read on his website, uh, the typefaces relate to various stencil sets he acquired, uh, and so capture differences in weight, width, and details of design that he's observed across the sets. So as I implied at the uh, start of the talk, there's much yet to figure out about these stencil letters and numerals, starting with the most basic question, who in fact designed them? Uh, if Monsieur Tevenon deserves the credit, well then, what exactly did he design when he joined Chevalier in the early 1870s, since that company was already producing letters, uh, letter and numeral stencils at, at that time? Indeed, we can even see a fairly close version, uh, as I showed you, of the letter already in the 1840s. Another thing we might ask is, how are the small design variations explained, of which there are quite a few when you begin comparing the many sets? It seems that several companies were making similar stencils, so it would be good to determine uh, who made what. By and large, most of us now encounter these letters and numerals in typographic form. And taken purely as form, the typical French stencil letters and numerals really do carry a lot of style. They hold their weight gracefully, their widths are stabled on lovely long serifs, their curves and proportions are often idiosyncratic in a way that subverts the rigidity so often found in their Dito ancestors. But in drawing attention to Le Corbusier's use of these letters and numerals as stencils, and by connecting them to his notion of the objet type, I've wanted to emphasize the stencils themselves as manufactured objects. Because I've begun to think that their more important dimension, at least in the 19th century, was their fabrication by mechanical means in many sizes and materials, which was a manufacturing achievement foremost. And I think the stencils tell us that. Their survival in large numbers suggests that their typicality is surely due, at least in part, and maybe in large part, to the huge volume in which they were made and distributed over many decades. So when you next run your eyes over these letters and numerals, ciphers of French industrial panache, bring to mind as well the stencils that have given them form. Thanks.